Hello, 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 and welcome to this episode of the Rent to Rent Success podcast. I am delighted to be here today with Louise Reynolds. Now, Louise is a property investor and developer, and she's got an interesting story because she got into property investment through the Rent a Room scheme. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that story with you. And Louise helps time-strapped professionals, often expats, but also people here in the UK, to invest in property. She does it with a prudent approach and keep listening because you will get access to that free information about how to prudently do your due due diligence so that you don't come a cropper. Louisa says family and friends are the cornerstone of her life and I know from experience that she's very organized, persistent and determined. Welcome to the show Louise Reynolds. Thank you Stephanie, thanks for inviting me. Yes, and I, of course, know you. We were on Clubhouse together back in Clubhouse's heyday. And then recently, when Kylie Anderson has done her iconic Woman in Wealth project, we were hosting together on a property show that time as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was probably six to eight weeks ago. We were on a property panel together. And then we're both contributing chapters to the the same Um, book which is all about um, increasing wealth for women Um, so yeah both coming at it from property but probably slightly different angles but yeah so we our paths have crossed on a number of occasions on platforms and um, now in print on a book in a book yeah yeah so so fun and I would love to know more about your story Louise I'm always fascinated by how did people get started in property yeah so um for me property is almost like a second career or third career even if you if you like um because i started out as a graduate trainee in in the consumer goods industry so my background is more sales marketing um so i worked in drinks industry and financial services in line marketing and sales roles and from there i went into management consultancy so i'd be advising on marketing strategy um sales strategy um portfolios to to to, to global or big you know blue chip companies so i've got a um, experience of being um both on the manufacturing and financial services side but also in terms of an advisory um capacity so for me um you know, I've, I've, I've lived in Surrey for um, 30 years now and um, got two grown-up children. But when I first got into property, it was trying to create a career and a business that fit around my family circumstances. Because at the time, I was doing very long hours commuting from Surrey into the city of London when I was a management consultant. And um, that was very time consuming in itself. But then also, as anyone who's worked in management consultancy or worked with management consultants will know that they work very long hours. Um, So, yeah, for me, I was starting to rethink about how um, I can make something work that work better for me and my family rather than always feeling run ragged and um, always at someone's beck and call. Um, And it also, for me, got me thinking very much about how time is very directly equated to, um, uh, so earnings are very directly equated to um, time. So, you know, if you wanted to earn more money, you just had to work longer hours, or if there was a deadline that had to be hit, and there always was with management um, consultancy and also um, projects had to be finished for clients. If you were up against a deadline, you just basically had to stretch your day, work longer hours um, in order to hit that deadline. But you weren't necessarily benefiting in, you know, from any of the upside of of, of that project because you were still getting paid the same amount, but just having to work that much harder. Mm-hmm. So um, I suppose it was around about that time. As we all do in property, read that seminal book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor mm-hmm. Dad um, by Robert Kiyosaki. And um, it brought a lot of things home to me just in terms of this whole concept of um good assets and bad assets you know that you, you know a, a, an investment property is a good asset your home um is an asset but in a different way because it's not making you money and things like cars are depreciating assets so they're they're not um you know they're, they're, they're more negative assets rather than than houses are um investment houses in, in terms of um generating income and, and profit and, and, and building your wealth through property. Mm-hmm. So it was at that stage I just started rethinking, well, I'd quite like to 
have an equation in my life where I'm earning more money while I'm asleep. Not that I'm lazy. I've always worked very yeah. hard. But just in terms of trying to break that link between if you want money to come into your life, you have to just work really, really hard and longer hours, which doesn't always work, really, if you're trying to bring up a family at the same time. So, yeah, that's kind of how I got into property. But um in terms of the first taste of owning a property, that was when I was living and working in London um, in consumer goods and drinks industry. And I was renting in and around London, various places around London, um, North London, South London. Um, but the first property I bought was in North London in Alexandra Palace. Um, and the only way I could afford to buy in London at the time, I know there's issues with affordability of, of, of housing and, and, and properties now, but the only way I could afford to do that was to buy a three bed flat which sounds more glamorous than it was it was a real sort of box a box room and then two other decent sized rooms was to rent out two of the rooms to help cover the mortgage and um, I had a um, former tax inspector in the family at the time and she was telling me about this rent a room scheme and I thought wow this is great having an um, an ex-tax HMRC tax inspector telling me about a tax break I thought wow you know this is this is great and then when I looked into it I thought well this is this is brilliant so the um, the rent a room scheme is where if you are a live-in landlord so you're actually living in the property and renting rooms out you get given a tax break so you get income free of tax up to a limit now, when I was doing this, this was back, you know, in 1986, 1987, a long while ago. Um, and the tax break was probably half what it is now. But now it's I think it's about sort of 7,500, if I've got that right. It was last year. I don't know whether it's changed, um, you know, for, for, for the next tax year. But that's quite a decent amount of income that you can get tax free. Um, and use that if you are trying to get on the on the property ladder because I know that your your route has been um, rent to rent but for me it's, it's just been an alternative um, to doing like like rent to rent it meant that I could get on the property ladder but also you know start to um, learn about this asset that is that is a property that can be an investment as well as a home. Oh that's such a that's so good because um, it's these little insights and these bits of knowledge and information that can be so transformational so there you were in London and there's three beds um that you've got two of the rooms rented out and how did you get from there to buying your first uh investment property then Louise uh that was probably quite some time afterwards actually so we we at that stage you see a lot of um investors now will not recognize interest rates as they are now you know having gone up um quite a bit on, uh, over the last 12 months with um what, what what's happened with our political uh, situation and, and what Liz Truss was, was 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 trying to do um but at that time um interest rates mortgage interest rates went up to over 15 percent so um, whilst I got on the property ladder and, you know, at that stage, things like endowments, you, pay, you paid um, into a um, with profits fund. And part of that goes, to, you know, part of that acts as life insurance. Part of it went to, to paying off um, the, um, the, the property um, debt. I um, got hit with negative equity. So even though I'd done the right things and getting on the property ladder. So that was quite hard. So I didn't make an awful lot of money in selling that property and moved on to and um from there yeah actually from there i moved um into some rented accommodation while we we're waiting for a property to be built in fact that was this property here in surrey we bought it off plan mm -hmm. um and it was once we were um you know we sort of settled here and got family then i started thinking about investing now at the time that i was thinking of investing it was 2000 um yeah 2007 mm -hmm. so the olympics the 2012 um, olympics had just been announced that were coming up in in london so i was starting to look at you know well, maybe stratford's the place to invest you know you you read all the stories about you know go where there's capital growth and infrastructure mm -hmm. and big events happening that must be good um and now this is going to sound a bit odd because I was looking at London, but I was also looking at Poland at the same time. And that, that just will sound quite wacky to some people because they're completely different. Um, 
But at the time I was setting up my business, Property Venture, to help other people invest. And at that time I was helping um, others invest in continental Europe. So I was seeing a number of um, opportunities come across my desk. And Poland at that time it still is to a certain extent, big um, recipient of EU funding, a lot of EU funds going into infrastructure projects in Poland, roads, um, railway network. And it's got some great main cities. The one that I was looking at has been Krakow. And um, so the, two very different categories of investment. One was, you know, very established capital city in, in Europe, <clears throat> London, um, with some stuff going on with the, with the Olympics. Mm. But when I started looking at the property prices there, I felt that some of the uplift had already been baked into the property prices because as soon as there was the announcement of the 2012 Olympics, you know, property prices already started going up. Mm. And, um, you know, we're talking at that stage, you know, looking at a two bed terraced cottage, £250,000 maybe, you know, this was quite some time ago. But then I was looking in the opposite extreme, looking at something in, in Krakow in Poland, which much, much lower um, um, entry level to get onto the property ladder in, in, in Poland, a lot um, cheaper. And for, for some reason, because I'd already been doing a lot of research and knew about Poland and, and, and um, its economic situation, I felt that in a way it was less risky because we had less money on the line. You know, if you're going to your first investment property at that kind of price point, it feels quite risky and particularly if there's you know there's a sense that a lot of the capital uplift had already been baked into the property prices it didn't feel as though i was in getting london. Good, yeah in london whereas in poland there was still a lot more scope so we ended up investing in in, in krakow in poland but i again i had done due diligence on stratford and in london but also in in krakow in poland so um so yeah i'm 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 a prudent property investor i like to do a lot of research before i um invest i just have quite a cautious um risk profile um so yeah i had to get really comfortable before we went into our first proper investment as a self-contained entity um aside from our home so yeah that, that probably sounds some, quite wacky to some people but yeah two completely different options and uh, give us an idea ballpark you said that in london at the time it was about 250 for a two bed and what, what sort of prices were there in Poland at that time? Yeah, so we ended up with a one-bed apartment. It was around about 56,000. Um, wow. And yeah, and so that was, in fact, it was it would what we would call um, airspace, you know, um, grabbing airspace now, because it was an old tenement building um, and the developer was building up um, one storey so the the apartment that we bought was on the new bills part of the um of the tenement building so all inside it was it was brand new um but it was within a character tenement building um and in a decent location at that stage you could get into the city center it was at the end of the tram line at that stage so you could get into the city center within seven minutes so it was a great buy to let location which is what we've used it for um since 2007 so we've had a um a buy to let fully occupied property since that time in in, in Krakow in Poland but it's right near um a lot of commerce so we've always had contract workers mm. working in nearby offices you know there's lots of multinationals um who have offices there um and since we bought it that that you know Krakow has expanded the tram line has expanded and now uh, we are but one stop on the tram line and the tram line is now so much bigger so it's interesting is that when you invest where you foresee infrastructure improvements and then they actually happen it does have this uplifting effect on the on the value of a, of a property so i think what it goes to show is that the fundamentals are the same investing in property whether it's the uk or poland or wherever it might be and it's just a question of checking things out and getting comfortable and making sure that you're comfortable with taking that level of risk whatever that level of risk might be 
Yeah, and I think that's why you're so valuable to the people you work with, expats wanting to invest in the UK or wanting to invest anywhere, actually, uh, because they can get that level of confidence. You've been doing this for years. You know about how to go through the due diligence process. And also you've had the experience of assessing risk and then seeing what happened over the period. So uh, what year are we in again, Louise? Remind me. 2023. No, no, no. Sorry. I mean, when you bought... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, i'm yeah. sorry um yeah, yeah 97 yeah in 97 you bought no. that property in poland sorry 2007 i bought that but 97 when i bought the first rent a room when i my first property with the rent a room scheme yeah okay so you had 97 and then 2007 you got this property in yeah. in in poland yes i know what year it is just about so 16 <laughs> is it 16 years ago um Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and do you know what the value is now, Lou? It would, um, it was over 90,000 when I last looked at it. I don't know that I think that the, the, the Poland has got, uh, the property price have probably plateaued out a little bit yeah. in Poland because w- what we sometimes forget in the UK is that we've got soaring inflation, yeah. we've got an economic squeeze, governments had to spend a lot of money helping people with energy bills, you know, the aftermath of COVID. There are other countries where, you know, they've suffered the same way. I mean, I was talking to, um, exchanging emails with um, a lady in the, the, the rental agency who manages the property on the ground for me. Mm-hmm. And I was saying, you know, what, what what's the latest situation and they in december had like 16 percent inflation when i was saying you know in in you know the uk it's you know over 10 percent. so there are other countries who are suffering um as well so yeah so i think that the the poland at the minute has experienced a plateauing of property prices in the same way that the uk is um to some extent as well and in the same way that we've had some relief for uh energy bills here in the uk the same thing has happened in poland and some of that um uh, government support has been withdrawn at the end of 2022 and you know they're now going back up to normal rates they had um vat concessions on their bills so yes yeah, so sorry that's a very long answer to um, it's probably plateaued a bit at the minute, but yeah, it would it would be closer to 90, 90 or thousand, over 90,000. And I suppose for a capital city, like in the UK, obviously even not a capital city, partly it's dependent, the property prices on earning power and uh, salaries and uh, lending, you know, what people can borrow, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm guessing that they are a bit lower than um, the... Yeah, in terms of um, yeah, in, t- in terms of the cost of living in in Poland and Krakow, it's 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 um, a lot cheaper than living in the UK. Mm. Um, the thing that's quite surprising, I think, for some people about Poland is that it's um, Poland has a highly educated workforce. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the big blue chip companies outsource, a, you know, a lot of their sort of white collar activities. Um, to countries like Poland because um, they they speak English really really well. Um, it's got some of the best universities um, around, and Krakow is the second city. So Warsaw's the capital, but Krakow is, to my mind, a real cultural um, centre, and it's it's um, it's almost like the Mayfair of London. It's it's in terms of um, cost of living standards and cost of housing. In Poland, it's quite expensive. So Warsaw and Krakow would tend to be amongst the most expensive places to buy property in Poland. You know, if you're going out further into the countryside, um, property would be an awful lot cheaper. Um, but, you know, th- th- there's a huge attraction to living and working in, in, a, in a city like um, Krakow because there's, there's so much industry and commerce there. Um, so, yes, getting onto the property ladder and um, cost of living um, is less in, in Poland and the main cities compared with with some of the cities here particularly London yeah yeah and um did you I'm just just noticing that for my own interest uh do you did you continue investing uh, in Poland or did you then uh, no we then we then invested in Surrey um we've had a very successful um investment property in Surrey as well and then we are just completing a development in Surrey as well um you know, we've owned uh, the Polish property, as you said, you know, since 2007 for you know 14 um, years or so. Um, 
and at some stage we're, we're going to be selling it we've just got to choose the right the right time when the market's not not quite so um so static but yeah if you're investing in a particular area i some I, I do think that it sometimes pays to get critical mass in a particular area because you know if you're buying one property or more you've still got to do to go through all the same bureaucracy so i have to do a polish tax return every year which you know we moan about doing um tax returns in the uk but when you have to do it in um in poland in a completely different language it, it does and, and in a different you know there are different allowances and different tax regimes um then it puts things into perspective so yeah we've, i've been doing a polish tax return for quite a number of years now and whilst we've been happy um and it's been successful and it works really well uh, for people particularly where um there's a polish connection because we've got you know i've, I've helped couples buy in Poland, you know, where there's a Polish connection in the family where, you know, um, uh, someone's married, um, you know, a Polish husband or a Polish wife, and they want to maintain that connection, and they want to pied a terre in one of the main yeah, cities. Yeah. Um, for pure investment, um, you know, there are different returns. So you would get um, higher capital appreciation here in the UK on the whole than mm. you would do in Krakow. So when I was talking about how much the apartment is worth now versus when we bought it in 2007 um it's gone up but the capital appreciation in the uk would have been significantly higher in the southeast i mean it might not necessarily be in wales or up north so it's it's you know the uk is very diverse whether you're talking yeah. about northeast south or west in terms of whether you're getting stronger yield or stronger capital mm -hmm. growth and it's the mm -hmm. same in other in other countries mm -hmm. um and on the whole you know, we have got greater levels of capital appreciation um, as well as getting income um, generated from Surrey. Because, again, in this area, when you know the pockets and the areas to invest, you can get in at um, uh, a decent price and still still generate a, a decent yield if you know the places to, to, to buy. Um so yeah it depends on what someone's after as to what they want but some people love having that polish connection and having a buy to let um have, and having this you know a business connection in poland as well so actually that's a good time to point people if you are thinking of buying or investing um in the uk or especially in poland um you can contact louise property hyphen venture.com stroke investment if you're watching on the video you'll see that on the screen now and that's at rent to rent success.com slash 166 um but we will also put it in the podcast show notes so that you can you can go there which brings me on to you have something called the prudent no the seven steps yeah, yeah the seven yeah 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 because um I, I'm, I'm quite risk averse. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I tend to think of myself as a prudent property investor. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm very careful in what I invest in, but, but also I carry that same approach through to when I work with my clients. So I offer a bespoke sourcing service to busy professionals who don't have the time um, to build their portfolio if they want to, either because they're not here on the ground. So like with expat clients who are based abroad, or even busy professionals in the UK who just don't have the time or know how to um, get invested in property. Yeah, so I, I take the same approach that I use for my personal investments and, and I apply that to, to, to my clients, which is very due diligence heavy. Great. So it's property-venture.com slash investment. If you want to get that, it's called the seven steps steps to de-risking property. But Louise, why don't you whet our appetite and give us a couple of those, second, the, what we'd call then the secrets to success in terms of um due diligence for property investment okay so um i think this is where i combine both my business background and 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 property i um so there's probably two things that i would talk about um one one is um a technique a technique that i used when i was a management consultant uh, in, when i was a management consultant which is called um triangulation so um when you check things out, and most people automatically go to checking out the property, um, 
if, for example, you want to um, check out uh, the demand for a, a property to, to make sure that you're buying in the right place, that you're going to get sufficient rental demand, um, you might do a bit of desk research. You might go and look at the number of properties for sale in that area or for rent. So I would say that that's one 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 source of information so a triangulation is looking for three different sources of information so you'll do some desk research you might speak to a sales agent or a letting agent um, and you might also speak to um, a mentor or um, a fellow property investor or someone who already invests in that area and for me you you really should be using this concept of triangulation getting three points or three sources of information to make sure that you're getting sort of a robust picture um, of what it is that you're about to invest in. And I always think that if it's something that's critical, you probably ought to get more than three points of information. You probably ought to, if it's really, really critical, be getting like seven points of information because different people have different perspectives. And if you rely heavily on one person's opinion, it can skew your your decision. So I would use that, that concept of triangulation um, to make sure that you've got robust research in place. And one of the things that I find with clients and, and really among my peer group, just talking with people and, and, and understanding where people have come a cropper is when people don't do due diligence on the people they do business with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important in property um, investment. Um, and particularly in today's day and age of social media, anyone can make claims on social media about how good they are, what they've done. Um, but if you follow up and you check people out um, and check out for consistency, you know, are they saying the same thing on LinkedIn and Facebook um, and Instagram? And can they back that up? And one of the really good sources that I use is Companies House. So if someone says I've got X, Y and Z companies and it's X, Y and Z turnover, there are some very simple places to go and look and to check things, um, to check things out, um, particularly if you're looking at doing, you know, joint ventures or, you know, um, just doing business with someone in property. You know, if someone's got a skill set you're putting money in or however you set up your property investments, um, do spend the time to check out people who you're going to be working with. It's not just about the property. Oh, so good. Because um, Matt Baker was the last person I was recording with and he was talking about um, JV investment and those longer term partnerships in property and um, and I think what you've said is crucial to that, really checking out the person and having that step by step process to go through so that you can feel reassured. Yes, I've been through a robust process because you've developed this seven steps over many, many, many years and lots of experiences, not just buying your own portfolio, but also uh, helping others to buy portfolios. So as I say, property-venture.com slash investment for that due diligence. It really is gold dust. So thank you for sharing that with us. We've talked about two of the secrets to success. Um, and I would like to know now, what would you say are some of the big mistakes that you've seen people making? Well, most, most of the time it is... Um... It is the people side of, of business. Yes. Um, I'll give you I'll give you an example, which is a, a salutary um, lesson. Um, I've got a friend who I was in business with um, in the past who is in property, and um, her and her husband um, had a business, um, and they the business was in Spain, but in a way the geography is irrelevant. It's the same thing that has ha has and can happen here in the UK. And they decided to invest in two rundown properties and renovate them. And they were going to make a profit out of that. And that was going to be part of their pension pot. So um, they'd been doing business with um, this um, individual in Spain. And they'd been working with him, I don't know, um, five, ten years, a very long time. So he was going to buy the property. They were going to um, put the funds in. He was going to do the renovation. And they were all going to profit. Happy days. Um they hadn't really checked out the guy that they've been doing business with. Um, and just over the years, they just thought, oh, you know, he, he would never do anything to upset us. Um, so even though they've been doing business with him for a long time, um, he's also a very persuasive guy. And he persuaded them to put the property title in his name in Spain. Wow. So he said, look, 
it's going to be much easier for me to sort things out on a day to day basis and to overcome the bureaucracy because they were so trusting of him. They thought that that was going to be fine. And I have met this chap and I did try and say I didn't know that this specifically was going on, but I did have cause to, to go on a business trip with him once. And I do remember coming back and saying, are you sure about him? Yeah, 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 he's fine. And then not long afterwards, I just had something about my gut instinct about this guy. And then there's all sorts of stuff that has come out in the woodwork. But anyway, what happened was they um, bought the property. It was all their money, none of his. It went into his name. And then, funnily enough, there was a major breakdown in the relationship. They never saw those properties again. And I, I just, yeah, horrendous story. And that's overly trusting someone and not checking them out. Yes. But even if you had checked the person out and they were honest, why would you put the title in their name? Go through the you, extra you, paperwork. You need, to put the right, yeah, you, you need to set it up right and protect yeah. yourself as much as possible. I mean, there's no, you, you can't protect against all eventualities, but certainly there are some things that basic checks and balances and structuring it right will help protect you a lot more than how they set it up. Absolutely. And it reminds me of a story. Um, a lady came on the podcast at, who remained anonymous, but she was stung by a property trainer who has appeared in the newspaper um, since and is still selling courses, to my knowledge. And she had loaned this chap some money, but her mentor had insisted that she sort out the title because she was supposed to have been put on this property title as a second charge. And she was waiting for the paperwork, nothing, nothing, nothing. Anyway, eventually she did it, luckily, because this guy went bust owing to everyone. But with this, because she had had the good advice, she had her charge registered against his home property uh, and so he did get repaid but you do need the good advice and um and that's where you come in really yeah well yeah and, and there are lots of different ways of, of structuring something and trying to um minimize risk i don't think you can ever eradicate risk um, but yeah, try and minimize and just go in with your eyes open, I think. Um, and that's what due diligence is about. Yeah. So, so good. So we've talked uh, a lot about due diligence, making the right decision when you're buying investment properties, when you're moving forward in investment. Um, I, this is the Rent to Rent Success podcast. And you know that we're very strong on due diligence in terms of making sure your rent to rent deals will work as well. And there are some similarities um, between what uh, what we do in, in due diligence for rent to rent and what Louise does. And the common thread is that you must utilize the experience around you not necessarily i'm saying obviously we 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 do offer mentorship but you maybe you don't have a mentor but maybe you have an advisor that you pay or a consultant or you've got a family friend who knows about these matters because you do need that voice of experience when you're new in something because in in property the mistakes can be so costly as as we've just heard yeah yeah there, there are some big there's some big upsides but then you need to protect yourself against the downsides as well so louise thank you so much for joining and as we come to a close is there anything that i haven't asked you that you would like to add and that you would like to leave people with um just just take the time to um check check things out and and um just keep your common sense about you you know i think that it's very easy to be persuaded and seduced by um the easy money you know and everything's going to fall into your lap and it all come really really easy i think um you do still need to put in a bit of effort and research um to to make sure you're keeping yourself safe um yeah so i would just just keep your common sense about you and as I mentioned earlier, the seven steps to de-risking property, you can get that on Louise's website at property-venture.com slash investment. We'll put that link in the show notes. And if you do want to contact Louise as well, she's also on LinkedIn 
uh, Louise Reynolds. So uh, thank you so much, Louise, for joining and sharing those nuggets of wisdom. I've enjoyed Such it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Such an important aspect. So, and I always enjoy talking to you. Uh, so it's been lovely. And thank you for watching and for listening. It's been great to be back again. And do pick up on that if you're buying investment properties, if you're worried about doing the due diligence and knowing whether a deal is a deal, then the seven steps to de-risking property is for you. And if you're just getting started in rent to rent and you'd like more information, we've got our 90-minute masterclass with um, case studies and guides and step-by-step -step of how it all works. And you can get that at rent to rent success.com slash guide, G-U-I-D-E. So until next week, have a great rest of the week. Believe bigger, be bolder, be a game changer. See you soon. Bye for now. Bye.